An example of an interpreted language is JavaScript. And by the way, if you've heard of Java, I know you've heard of JavaScript. They have nothing to do with each other. It's just that Java was popular, and so the inventors of JavaScript kind of wanted to go, you know, right on their coattails. So, JavaScript is an interpreted language. It is sent to your browser as a text file. Let's just pick some random website. I don't know what. Um, let's go to eBay. If we go to eBay, and we right-click and we do View Page Source, we see some scripts. The script is just written in uh, in English form. Every time you access a web page on eBay, it sends this program, it sends all this script, which is run at runtime. As the page loads, the browser executes all this code in order to modify the elements on the web page. Right, to make them look pretty or, you know, to hide things and to move things and to make light up menus so you move the mouse over and they change and stuff like that. So I think I use the uh, idea of emulation software when you're going to emulate a video game to run on a system that it's incompatible with. Python's the same way. Python is, in effect, emulated. The reason it's emulated is so that the same language can run on Windows, on Mac, on Linux, on, on your phone if you have Python installed on your phone, and so on. It's the same language. Whereas something that's compiled down to an executable or an app, you know full well that that iPhone app's not going to work on your Android phone or vice versa. They have to be written separately for each one. And there are frameworks that are designed to make it easier to write something that'll compile to both of them. But by default, they do not. Interpreted code, you have a good chance that it'll work you know, on whatever operating system. So this is the shell. You can type commands directly into it, but you wouldn't want you would not want to enter a program. By the way, um, you can configure idle through one of the options somehow to launch directly into the file new menu. And I had that at home, and when I recorded a lecture, I felt like an idiot because uh, it popped up in the new file mode, and so the students who would have been following me did not see me do file new. It may be one of the options in configure idle. At startup, open the edit menu. Right, that just saves time. If you feel like doing that, I'm going to leave it on shell window because people watching this might not have this set. But if you set open the edit menu in settings, then whenever you launch idle, let's dock that to the taskbar. Whenever you launch idle, it'll come and you don't have to do file new. Kind of nice. I'm going to undo that change, but you might want to set that. So anyways, why don't I do file new in preparation for typing in notes? I'm sure I'm going to do some. So I believe this is lecture C since we missed school on Tuesday. Got a mini vacation. And by the way, if you don't know it, don't come on Monday. It doesn't affect us, but if you have Monday classes, we don't have. Campus closed that day as well. So programs, the way a program usually works is it takes input, it processes it, and it displays output. And in a more rigorously typed language where you have to define all your variables before you use them, Usually there's another step. Allocate the data, allocate the variables you're going to use, and then get the input, and then do the processing, and then do the output. That could be far more complicated than that, right? It might be looping. You know, looping is what computers are all about. Um, you know, when you're playing a video game, it's looping, you know, 60 times a second or 90 times a second or whatever, you know, your frame rate is, accepting input, you know, from your control devices and updating the things on the screen, right? So it's looping. We'll learn how to make our code loop. Typically what happens is if we write a program, you know, like this, A equals input, you know, quote, enter a word. I'll probably comment this out. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. Yeah. Enter a word, and then we do something about it, print A times 2. Now that's kind of silly, right? We're taking a word and we're multiplying it by 2. You may be interested to see what happens. 
but quite often, the first time you're exposed to this stuff, you wish it were looping and it's not, right? Inner word, hello. Okay, print it out, hello times two. If you do that times two and it's a string, it just doubles the string. Or if you did times three, it would print hello, hello, hello. You know, or if you did times 20, it would print hello out 20 times. Multi a asterisk, the multiplication symbol with a string rather than a number, just does that repeating thing. That could be kind of neat. Like, what if you wanted to print, you know, 60 dashes across the screen? You could just do this. And I'm entering this in a shell rather than another program. But, right, I could print an asterisk times 60 or a dash times 60. And boom, there's my row of asterisks. Kind of nice. I'd rather do that than type in 60 asterisks there. But anyways, people run the code, all right, or, you know, enter your age or whatever it was supposed to do. They type it, and then they want to do the same thing again, right? It was asking for a temperature, and it wanted to convert it to something else. And so they type in a different temperature, and it doesn't do anything, right? The program is no longer running. It has exited. It started at the top, and it went straight down, and it ended. Okay, now I'm going to show you something that may make sense if you've done programming in C, C++, Java, some other languages. I'm going to declare what's known as a main function, and I'm going to call it. You absolutely do not have to set up your code like this. I'm just going to demonstrate it, and then you can genesis it out of your mind for now. Okay, so in this language, you, and, and we're leaping way ahead of chapter one, you define a function with a DEF keyword. DEF main parentheses in parentheses colon A equals input parentheses quote enter a word in parentheses quote you don't have to type along print A times 2 okay what I did is I created a main function I've broken my code in effect it'll compile okay but when I run it all oh, right, it didn't do anything. Why? Because that code's tucked away in a function, but nothing ever invokes the function. It's like I wrote a recipe down, but until I give the recipe to you until you'd actually bake it, doesn't do anything. But now that that function is in memory, I can call it main parentheses in parentheses in our word. Right? I'd like to call that from my code, though, right? I don't want to have to run it from the shell. So I could just do this, main parentheses in parentheses. Right, you don't have to put that space there. That does the same thing. Now, why did I demonstrate that to you? It is a good idea to put all of your code into functions for reasons that I'll explain at a future point. I just wanted you to see it now. You don't got to do that. Certainly do not have to do that now, but this is called a main function. And if I refer to the main code, it means the first thing that happens when it runs. Whether it's indented or not, whether it's in a main function or not, it was my main code before I put it in a function, it's still my main code. Now usually this call to main is made a, even a little bit fancier. It's tucked away inside of an if statement. We'll see that syntax soon. I'm just going to leave it like this. So from here on out, all the code I enter is going to be tabbed over, but if you did not create a main function, which I'm not expecting you to do for your homework, then it would not be tabbed, right? So if I was going to convert this to the way I would expect your homework to do, you don't have to do this because, you know, you're taking all the time to type it. But if I was going to convert it to look like the homework assignment, it would just look like that, right? Just like it did before. You could put a comment, you know, hashtag main, but I'm going to undo that. I want you all to see what more professional code looks like so that you start writing more professional code as you go along. I may not put everything in a main as we do our lectures. But then, you know, then again, if I remember to, I probably will, just to get y'all in the habit of it. If you do put your code in a main function, you gotta invoke it. Unlike the C, C++, Java languages where the mere act of defining it tells the language to go ahead and run it. So input, processing, and output, we've done this already. Name is equal to input, enter your name, and then if you printed the name, it would print the name that you had typed in. Now they're doing it from the shell, which I wouldn't really bother doing. I'd put it in a program for the same idea. And when I say program and script, I use those terms interchangeably because a program 
is just a series of instructions, right? And the script is the source code for the program. So the input function always takes a string from the keyboard, meaning that you have to convert it to a number. You have to use either INT or you have to use float. And by the way, while we're looking at this, the online students have already had a very short video on this, but let's go ahead and take a look at C Engage just while we're talking about it. There should be a C Engage or mind tap set in the modules. There are not due dates on them because I'm expecting you to do them, to take responsibility for them, but most specifically so that you can retake them as many times as you want, right? You take the quiz, you don't make 100 on it, go ahead and redo it. It's just up to you, right? You're going to be responsible. You know that we're in chapter one. You can go and do the chapter one stuff, but certainly by the time we hit chapter two, that's your clue. Oh, I'm going to go and do the chapter one mind tap. Don't, you know, put it off and wait until chapter four to go back and start working because it's useful knowledge. But anyways, if I go into C Engage, I will see, let me slip into student mode, although it'll give me an error when I try to actually invoke it, which annoys me. I wish that I could be in student mode for C Engage as well. But if I do student view and I click on modules and I go down to C Engage, like say I want to do programming exercise 1.2. Several of y'all have already done that, but these weren't posted until recently. So you may not have noticed them. It'll come up like this, and this tool needs to be loaded in a new browser window. And by the way, when you click on a YouTube video, sometimes it just looks really lousy. Let's find a YouTube video. Okay, that's, that's better than what one of the other classes is seeing, which is just a sad face here. It's like, yeah, that's really useful. But if you click on the title of the video, it will go ahead and open YouTube and view it there. At least this one's displaying that. All right, so if I wanted to go into programming exercise 1.2, you can do all the programming exercises. Nothing's wrong with starting with one and going to the end. On the other hand, you could just write on scratch book, you know, I'm, I need to do two, four, five, six, and seven. And they do tell you whether they're for a grade or not. Now, I know from bitter experience that if I click um, while I'm student view, I'm going to get an error. Y'all won't, hopefully, but I will. If you do not have C Engage yet, if you do not have not purchased a textbook, I'd recommend going ahead and doing that. All right, so now if I go into it, if you have pop ups blocked, it may not load. If you have cookies blocked, if you have a ad blocker of any kind, may not load. If you start running into problems like that, first thing you ought to try is just use another browser. That may be the fastest fix. If you like Chrome, try Firefox. If you've tried those, then try Edge. Right. You may be able to fix it real fast, you know, to get it done in a hurry and then diagnose it, right? Disable your password blocker, right, yeah, not your best your password blocker, your ad block or whatever. Start assignment now. Okay, so this is programming exercise 1.2. If you don't have Canvas loaded, don't worry because this is, I mean, if you don't have it purchased yet for today's lecture, no problem because it's just like three or four lines of code. Write a Python program that prints, displays your name, your address, your phone number. All right, I can do that. Right? Put your code here. We know what a print statement looks like. Print, parentheses, quote, my name is Superman. Where do I live? Fortress of Solitude. End quote in parentheses. What's my phone number? Print. I'm really important. My phone number is just one, 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 one. All right. Whatever. I'm going to run it. And it worked. If I'd made an error, if I'd left off a of parentheses, I would get an error message over here instead. This is actually kind of neat in a way, right? Being able to see your code and the output right there. And there are online Python you know, compilers that'll let you do it that way. I kind of like it. But I like using idle more because it's installed by default every time you install Python. OK, so I got an error, and it's telling me, hey, by the way, you got a syntax error. It says, oh, it's in line 3, but it's not. If you look at a line that it says is an error, 
and you do not flat out do not see it look in the line above quite often it doesn't notice that there's an error until the line following the one where the problem really is right I messed up two and it's telling me the syntax errors on line three because it didn't figure out there was an error until it hit line three just a word to the wise and if you get stuck take a picture of your code and send it to me and I'll probably spot the syntax error but if you look at a line of code and you just flat out do not see the syntax error in it before you text it to me, look on the line above it and maybe it'll leap out. Alrighty, and then it says click the submit button. Well, where is the submit button? I believe if you come over here to tasks, run checks, and then submit. Kind of non-obvious, right? Maybe there was a tutorial showing you how to do this. I didn't spot the tutorial, but it didn't seem obvious to me. So, you know, and then I'm going to go to the next question. I don't see how to move to the next question. All right, somebody's done this. How do I move to the next question? Do you I actually have to close the, it? Yeah, you have to press the X, and then it'll take you back to all the assignments, and you can just go to the next one. That's all right. what I've been doing. Then. All right, yeah, I wish there was an easier way to do that, but then you can do that. One thing to notice is that when you're in this view, some of them are marked for practice and some for grade. Oops, I did not mean to make 2.1 for a grade. I guess it would not take long to do it. If it says for a grade, you may as well do it, even though it wasn't listed. Now, on the other hand, if you do not do the ones that are listed in C Engage, it's okay because they're not the grades are not going to show up in C Engage whether you do them or not. I'll try to fix that but I may not be able to do it. I may not be able to change it because people have already done the assignments right and it may not let me switch it back to practice mode for those. The ones that are listed in the modules, the only ones that are mandatory. Nothing wrong with doing a few more though. All right, back to the lecture. So two type conversions, int and float. Well, that's slightly inaccurate. There's three type conversions, but one of them you rarely use. There's three data types. There's int, there's float, and then there's string. That's important enough that I'm going to go and put that as a comment in my code. <coughs> three data types. There's more than that, actually, but the three key ones to begin with are int, which stands for whole number, integer, And then there's floats, which stands for a fractional number. In other words, decimal point, right? And then there's a string, which is just typewriter characters between quotes. Now the things between the quotes can even be numbers, but it's not an int or float if it's got quotes around it. You have to convert it in order to use it. And that's why we were using that float command to get our input, to convert our input, like if we asked how many pounds, so we could do math on it. Now, when we write this stuff, it becomes really annoying to me if we have to type in too many things every single time we run it. So I'm just going to comment out those two lines because they were just a demonstration, right? We don't care. Yeah, I'm going to comment those two things out. There are three conversion functions. There's int, which converts to an int. There's float, which converts to an int. Excuse me, a float. And then there's str, which converts to a string. This is the one you're going to use. This is the one you're going to use most often. Even if the book or the uh, mind tap is showing you int, your homework I would recommend using float. Why? Because if you use int, it's going to crash if they type in a decimal point even if it looks like a whole number. If they type in 3.0, you try to convert 3.0 to an int, it's going to crash. Like if I do this, i equals int, well, uh, I'm going to make this a little bit more sophisticated. s, for like string, equals quote 3.0, end quote. And then i equals int, parentheses, S in parentheses, just like this had been an input statement, right? S is equal to input, parentheses input. 
This is going to crash. It's going to give me a runtime error. Boom. It says invalid literal for int 8 with base 10. Okay, that's a lot of words to tell me that it's the wrong format. But 3.0 is not an integer. So, crashed. To fix that, I could do one of two things. I could take the .0 out and it would suddenly start working. Or I could change this to a float. So I'm going to comment that one out and then say error data is not an int. And then I'm going to add one that actually works. I is equal to float parentheses s. Now what if for some reason you needed it to be a string rather than a number you can do math with? This is kind of rare in my opinion, but you might want to do it. You could do this, s equals str parentheses i in parentheses. That would take whatever that variable was and convert it into a string, something with quotes around it. How do we know it's a string? Yeah, a couple of ways. I'm going to run the program. And then after it's done, if I type S, ooh, it didn't work. Make a liar out of me. What if I just put S here and hit enter? That's, that's really non-standard syntax, but it might do what I'm trying to get it to do. All right, is it just not running main? Okay, did that. What if I had my S there beforehand, like I originally had it planned? Okay, that's not working. But what if I wanted to know the type of that variable? I could do this. Oh, and now I see why I'm not getting my variable. I'm not ex going to explain why. Type parentheses S into parentheses. And I put that inside the other parentheses. What the type function does is it tells us what type of data it is. I'm going to copy that and paste it and also put type parentheses i so we can see the difference between those two pieces of data. The first one's going to be the s, the second one's going to be the i. Let's find out. All right. And it's saying that the first one is an str, correct, because it's the string. And we see that the second one is a float. Now, variable names are only for the humans. We don't really care what the variable names are. Excuse me, the, vari the computer doesn't care what the variable names are. I could just make up a word. I could say that instead of s, and by the way, don't do this, because I'll probably undo it. That's my variable name. And as long as I use that everywhere I had S, it's good. like I said, don't do this. It would work just as well. The program's still going to work, right? The variable name is just for the human. The computer would process it regardless of whether it's written in English word or Korean word or a whole bunch of gobbledygook. I'm going to undo those three changes. They do not have intrinsic meaning to the computer. They're just for us. We ought to be giving good variable names. Since this is just demo code, I have not given any good variable names. Anybody stuck with syntax errors yet? Nope. All right. Usually, you're not going to print out the types. I may just comment that stuff out. About the only reason I've ever really seen using the plus sign at this point in the game. Later on, when we're doing graphical user interfaces, we use a plus sign a lot, or, or the string function a lot, excuse me, is look if, if I do this, print parentheses s equals end quote comma s, not make it i, backspace, sorry, quote i equals end quote comma i in parentheses. And when I run it, notice that space there. That comma got turned into a space. You may not like that. You may not want a comma there. 
Let me give you another example of that. No, I think that's enough for now. If I did not want to see that space there, I would use the str function. And you'll see examples of this probably in the textbook. i equals end quote plus str parentheses i in parentheses in parentheses. Since it's a plus sign, it's not going to embed an automatic space. But the plus sign would not work if it was just plus i because it's trying to add, don't delete that, if it's trying to add a number to a string, which is impossible, right? You can't take the word Fred and add two to it and have it mean anything, right? What's Fred plus two? I don't know. So if you don't want a space in the middle of your print statement like that, if you don't want the comma turning into a space, you can remove it, put a plus sign instead, and if you need to, convert your variable to a string. And now that will work. Boom, right, looks good, if that's what you want. Now, honestly, I don't bother. Here's what I do to fix it. I'm just gonna copy that line and paste it. I don't care if there's a space there. It looks better to me, though, if I put the space there, right, so that there's a space before and after the equal sign. I like that. That's my favorite way of doing it, rather than doing the plus str thing or seeing a space there and not one there. But whatever. The input function always returns a string. So if you're going to do math, you always have to convert it. I recommend converting it to a float unless you have a real strong reason to force it to be a whole number. There's a way to get it to be converted to a whole number where it would not crash. If this makes sense to you, you can do it. If it doesn't make sense to you right now, it's okay. But what if we had a number stored in a string like this? I'll tell you what, I'm just going to type it. x equals input parentheses quote enter x in quote in parentheses. If I wanted to make sure that was an integer and I did not want it to crash if they typed in 1.0, if I had typed this x equals I in, excuse me int parentheses x it would crash if they typed in something because you cannot convert something with a decimal point like that. But you could convert it to a float and then convert it into an int. Now, I'm probably not going to do this again in this class, but you can just tuck it away in your brain. If it makes sense, if it hooks, great. That would convert it to a whole number. It takes the string, converts to a float, then to an int to prevent it from crashing if the user enters a decimal point. I would only do that if it absolutely had to be a whole number. A side effect of that is, is that what if they type in 2.5? It's going to get treated like it's 2, right? This INT conversion is going to take that 2.5 and turn it into a 2. But I always just use float. Unless there's a strong reason. try to make it an it. In other words, I wouldn't do it that way. So I would just do input parentheses quote enter x in quote in parentheses and then x equals float parentheses x. Or the short form x equals float parentheses input parentheses quote enter x colon end quote in parentheses. I haven't been putting the colon after these things or anything and so it looks kind of dumb when it runs. What do I mean by that? Just there's no space there, right? 
I didn't put my greater than sign or a colon or anything. So I may go back to my input statements, right, and add colons and spaces and stuff to make them look prettier. I had one up here too. Okay. Like that. So you could do either one of these. You could do it in two steps, or you could just do it in one step. And then we could do something with x, for x squared or whatever. Now, in one of Ken Dewey's classes, they, he has you write a program that mm -hmm. will ask for input, and the input that you give it might be in so-called hexadecimal. If you know what hexadecimal is, great. We haven't talked about it yet. But then if you're going to try to convert it to an int, it would not work. What do I mean by that? What if your number looked like this? S is equal to float. F A, one, two, three, end quote. That is a hexadecimal number. And if we tried to convert that into a number to do math, like I is equal to INT or I is equal to float, like that, it's going to crash because this is expecting base 10. It's expecting, you know, 0 through 9. It's expecting, you know, our digit systems. It's not expecting these letters. Hexadecimal is just a numbering system that's got extra letters in it to represent the numbers 10 through 15. I do not care if you know what hexadecimal is right, right now or not. I just want to show you that INT can accept a second parameter, which is the so-called base, or radix, R-A-D-I-X of this. You remember when I ran it and I got an error here? It said base 10. It's trying to convert that into base 10, um, from base 10, but it's got these letters in it. But if I do comma 16, convert the string, using base 16 parentheses hexadecimal. Again, I don't care if you remember this. Why do I show you things that I don't care? Because you're going to see it again later and the first time you see it, you know, it may fly over your head a little bit if it makes sense perfectly, totally great, but the second time you see it, it'll, it'll hook, right? And then if we print it out I, well what is FA123? Let's find out print parentheses s comma equals whoops sorry backspace s comma quote equals end quote comma i comma quote in base 10 end quote We're going to find out what FA123 is when converted into base 10. I'm going to get real tired of typing in this input. I may wind up commenting it out. There we go. FA123 equals, you know, 1 million, whatever that is, or 100,000, whatever that is. True enough. Who cares? Right? Oddly enough, if you type in something, don't do this. I mean, you, you can do whatever you want. But if I type in 1,000, 1,000 in base 16 is not equal to 1,000 in base 10. So if I run that, it's going to display something different for what that equals, 4096. We'll explain base 10 and base 16 future lecture. You may already know if you're a computer, you know, computer engineering major or if you've taken, you know, fundamentals and covered it. Why not? Yeah, I'll just leave that. So if you take float and have a string of digits in there, either from an input statement or just something you created right there, it'll convert it to a floating point number. INT will convert it to a whole number. 
input and then inside the parentheses had better be something that you want to display or just that if you don't want to display anything. That works too. Returns a string waiting for the user to type in something. Print parentheses and then you have all these arguments here separated by commas. Prints each argument one by one separated by a space. What's this plus sign do? I already mentioned it but it does what's known as concatenation. That's the fancy technical accurate term for it. Instead this book gives you a nice English term for it. Glues the two strings together. Let's play with that. We're going to make variables for first name, last name, and then we're going to concatenate them into a whole name. Fn, for first name, is equal to Clark, in parentheses. Put whatever you want. Ln, for last name, and that's a lowercase l, not a 1, equals, quote, Kent, end quote. Full name equals fn plus ln, parentheses. And now let's print the name. Maybe I'm just going to say name, right, rather than full name. Let's print out the results of that, of that concatenation. Print, parentheses, quote, name equals, end quote, common name. Clark Lent, that is not what I meant. Clark Kent, how about that? Like I said, if I have an input statement and I have to test the program 20 times in a row, I get tired of it. Okay, it says name is equal to Clark Kent. And do I like that? No, I'd really rather see a space there. <coughs> I can fix my code so that there's a space there though between the fn and the ln, I want a space there. So after the plus sign, I'm going to put quote, space, quote, followed by another plus sign. You see what that's doing? It's adding the first name, gluing, concatenating the first name followed by a space and the last name. And when we print it out, now it will look nice with the space between the first and the last name. Enter X. Yeah, I'm getting real tired of that. I'm going to go and comment that out right now. One day, all right, name equals Clark Kent. So let's add a comment here. Plus does addition when the, I'm going to give a really fancy word here, operands are integers. Plus does concatenation, gluing is what the book calls it, when the operands are strings. Now what the heck's an operand? If I do this, x equals 1 plus 2, the plus sign is the so-called operator. An operator is a symbol that does like arithmetic. The things on either side of the operator are the operands. So plus is the operator, and 1 and 2 are the operands. And we may use a, that term a lot, operands. Fancy word, it just means the two pieces of data that are being added together. I said I was going to comment out that input. I really am going to do it. I'm going to come up here, find my enter x in my, that business, comment that out so I don't have to do it every single time. When you look at these notes after class, right, or if you watch the video from home, just be aware that, you know, a lot of input statements may be commented out. But if you watch the video, it'll make sense. Anybody getting syntax errors at this point? You wish my eyes. Okay, I'll be right back over there. By the way, if you do this and you run it and it doesn't produce any output, it's probably because 
either you don't have the call to main or it's indented. Right? If I do this, don't add that indention. It's not going to do anything. Why? Because Python executes the first unindented line of code. It's indented, so it never calls the main function. Have to have that there. And yeah, I had scrolled that off, and there was wound up being a bunch of blank lines and stuff like that. So if your code wasn't running, it's probably because that's missing. Whoops, don't need that. So, Python scripts are text files. We typically give them the PY extension. If you use some other kind of development framework, it may give it a slightly different extension. Notice that if you save your Python file, which I've done, right? Each time I run it, it saves it. And then you come out to the operating system and you double click it, it actually runs it. It doesn't edit it, it runs it. You can right click it and choose edit. Edit with idle. That's how you're going to have to actually edit it rather than just double click it. It may do stuff even worse. If idle is configured in some way, it may try to run WinPy or PyWin or something like that. If that was the case, I would certainly edit it and then run it from within Python. Right, like that. This is showing Python running on a Mac. I know it's a Mac because of the cute little circles over there on the other side. However, it's showing Python 3 running on the Mac. Python comes installed by default on the Mac, but it comes with Python 2. If you're on a Mac, I'd go ahead and install Python 3. Once you do that, it may pop open a warning every single time you're running it saying, Done. Please stop. All right. Sorry. There we go. Install Python 3 on your Mac, but when you run it, it may give you a warning message. Anybody got a Mac right now in here? When you run it, pardon me. Okay. Anybody have one here? Yeah. When you run your Python program, does it display a warning? Just go ahead and run it. It won't be anything. Okay, so you're missing that statement main at the bottom of your code, like I mentioned. By the way, guys, interrupt me if uh, code's not behaving what you want. Go down the very bottom of your code. I type in M A I N, parentheses, in parentheses. I'm not seeing the error. Good, good. Maybe they fixed it. There we sure. Is anybody else is not printing any input? Or excuse me, printing any output when you run it. If it is, it's because main's missing. Never mind, guys. It seems like they fixed the warning message. If you're getting a warning message, then uh, I can email you to link a link on how to fix it. This is stuff all well worth reading, but I don't have to go through every page on it because y'all have eyeballs and can read. This is a good thing, good point though. Syntax are the rules, the grammar of the language. The Python syntax whoopsie, indicates that if you do something like this, if you do x is equal to 1, that is not the same thing as 1 is equal to x. Python syntax, along with a lot of other programming languages, dictate that the variable has to be on the left side, and the so-called expression, the value, has to be on the right. This is a syntax error. So when I run it, it's going to give me an error. Can't assign to literal. All right, so the syntax is just the grammar. Grammar of the language, the order in which things have to be done. Why did it give an error about a so-called literal? A number like that, that's 
I'm going to use a, a funny term that I will keep using hard coded into the program rather than something that the user typed in is known as a literal or a numeric literal. It's literally typed into the code. And, you know, we cannot change the value of one, right? Like the universe, you, you can't change what three means. Yeah, um, you know, yeah, I guess you can make up another word for three, but three is three always. So the grammar, the syntax is that the variable goes on one side, the number or the calculation goes on the other, and if you mix it up, that's a syntax error. If the program picks up, detects a syntax error, it won't even run. Please correct all your syntax errors before you give it to me. You'll know that you have syntax errors. It's, it's not subtle, right? Get rid of those two lines. Can you say that one more time? Which part? Uh, about the syntax error? Yeah, yeah. A syntax error is just a mistake in the grammar. Like this, that's a syntax error. Or if I do this, print hello, and then I forget to put an end quote, mm -hmm. the syntax of the language is the rules it has to follow. The rules of the language are that the variable has to go on this side, and that if you have an open quote, you got to have a closed quote. So when I run it, it yells at me, syntax error. And I don't want you to turn and code that as a syntax error, right? It, it fails completely. It would not convert pounds to kilograms or whatever if it's doing that. Please fix all those errors. And if you can't figure them out, take a snapshot of the screen, text it to me, and I'll point it out. So I'm going to fix that one. I'm surprised it didn't flag that one as a syntax error, but let's run it. OK, that's another one. I wonder why it found that one first. Anyways, so I have to fix both of those. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. OK, cool. All right, fundamental ideas of computer science. The algorithm is a series of steps to solve a problem. It's not a program. It's just the idea behind the program. The algorithm for calculating the area of a circle might be input radius, calculate area according to this formula, and output the area. Right, three steps, input, calculation, output. But that's not a program. I've just given you a description in English. That's the algorithm. And then it's up to you to take that algorithm and to turn it into a program. So languages such as Python are high level, meaning you get to use nice English words that accomplish a lot of tasks. And I know I demonstrated this last time, but hello world and assembly. I know I mistyped assembly. Let's look at it. That's how you print out hello world if you're doing so-called assembly programming, which is low-level programming. Low-level because you have to specify a whole bunch of things. You're pretty much writing machine language. It's one step above machine language, which is just the zeros and the num in the ones. We can do all that with a single print, right? All we have to do is print parentheses, quote, hello world. One line of code, boom, it's easy. That's why it's called a high-level language. It is, obscures the details. We don't need to know how to do all this stuff in order to write a program, and that's a blessing. If you had to write, like, um, you know, Excel or Word or, you know, a video game and you had to use Assembler, mm, well, that's what they did when writing Pac-Man, you know, and, and all the other really, really old video games and the Nintendo, you know, 8-bit video games. But being able to write in a high-level language lets you write much more complex programs much more quickly. And so it's a blessing to have high-level languages. You would not be able to write Call of Duty or Fortnite or anything like that using assembly language. Now, assembly language was good enough to send people to the moon and back, so you can do it, but it takes a lot, lot more discipline in order to write assembly. We like high-level languages because we can get a lot done with a little bit of time. So the interpreter takes the Python program to a lower-level form that can be executed on a real computer. What does that mean? I have a script here. When I want it to run, I do run module. Well, what happens? Like a slide shows back here, there's a syntax checker. Make sure there's no syntax errors. 
Once it passes that, it runs through a so-called translator. The translator turns it into the zeros and the ones that the computer can actually process. So the translation takes our nice English-like program and turns it into zeros and ones. And then something called the Python Virtual Machine, that emulator I talked about, just like your Nintendo emulator that you can run on, on your PC to play Nintendo games or on your Android phone or whatever, takes that code and actually interfaces with the machine to do the work. Am I going to ask you a quiz question about how the, or you know, an exam question about how the Python Virtual Machine works? No. You know, if there's a quiz question on MindTap about it, just look it up, you know, you're good to go. There's nothing wrong with having two windows open or whatever, you know, to answer the quiz questions. The Python shell executes the command right on the spot. You don't write your programs in the Python shell. Idle is a integrated development environment. Who knows where the L came from? The L came from the fact that the guy likes Monty Python's Flying Circus and one of the members is named I. Eric Idle. Integrated just means that it comes with the text editor and the way of running the program, the compiler and the trans, you know, the translator all in one nice window, right? Like that. Rather than having to write a file by hand, then going to the command prompt and then running the program, you know. I could do that. Right? Let me find one of my programs. Desktop. CIT1203, DIR, startup, PY. Well, I can run lecture C, right? If I type lecture C.py, it did run it, but what you would normally have to do is type in Python space lecture C.py, and it would run it like that, right? It's a several step process. I could edit that file with a text editor. Then I could save it and I could run it like that. But since we're using integrated development environments, we don't have to do anything that complicated. We just type it in, click run, and it goes. When a Python program is executed, it's translated into so called bytecode. The bytecode is just kind of an encoded version of the program, it's encoded in such a way that the emulator, the Java runtime machine, that's written for the Mac or written for Windows or written for, for Linux can take the same bytecode and then run it, interface with the, the, uh, the computer, the operating system in order to display the Windows and the output and all that. And what is the syntax? It's a set of rules that the language, the code that you have to write has to follow. The syntax is kind of arbitrary. They got to make the syntax up. Don't type this because it's wrong. Um, but if you type in x is equal to 1 plus 2, that is the syntax. But if you do x is equal to 1 space 2 space plus, it's called Polish notation. Used to be able to buy HP calculators that work like that, where the operator follows the two values. Or you could have reverse pol Polish notation that looked like this, plus 1 and 2. And it would take 1, you know, one and two, and add them together. If you needed to chain a long expression together using, you know, Polish notation, one, two added together, and then multiplied it by three, yeah, that's a syntax. But it's not the syntax that this language follows. Right. So the syntax is just the rules in the order in which the operators have to appear. The rules are that if you have an operator like the plus sign, it's got to have two operands and that they have to be on the left side of the expression and the variable has to be on the right. That every function call has parentheses, that's a rule. Even the function that we wrote ourselves. That some functions have data that is passed in between the parentheses. <coughs> that the pieces of data that you pass into the function are separated by commas. That every opening quote has a closing quote. That you can interchange you can swap out between double quotes and apostrophes, but you can't mix them up on the same line. That would work, but that would not. Those are all syntax rules. All right, we're going to come up with some homework. This is not going to be too hard right here. I'm going to create a multi-line comment 
by typing in triple quotes. You could also use three apostrophes. A multi-line comment does not require you to put a hashtag on each line. The only reason I'm doing that is to save myself time so I don't have to type the hashtag on each line. So, homework. Write a script that will calculate the perimeter, perimeter diagonal and area of an 8.5 by 11 inch sheet of paper. So what's the perimeter? The perimeter is just the distance around the edges. What's the diagonal? It's the diagonal. Like you use the so-called Pythagorean theorem. And what's the area? It's the height and the width. I can make you look up the formulas. I could even tell them to you, make it easier. Formulas. Perimeter. Or maybe just P, I don't care. Perimeter is equal to 2 times the width uh, plus 2 times the height. Now you don't have to use variables here. You could just put in 2 times 8.5 plus 2 times 11. How you structure the program is up to you. If you need me to provide you an algorithm, you know, a series of instructions, a series of steps in order to do it, text me and I will. So what is the area? The area is just the height times the width, right? Area equals height times width. And then what's the diagonal? We're going to need the square root function because the diagonal is equal to the square root of width squared plus height squared. We need to know how to do these things, these squares and square roots and stuff like that. So let's go back to our notes and figure it out. I'm going to go back up to the bottom of main and calculate the value of 3 squared. x is equal to 3 star star 2. That's 3 squared. If I need to calculate the square root, there's two ways to do that. I could import the math library and use that. Or I could just use star star 0 0.5. It's kind of a little trick for, for figuring out the square root. Now I'm going to give you this formula including the double asterisks for the square root just to make it really easy on this homework assignment. But x is equal to 4 star star 0 0.5. That's the square root of 2. If you can't figure out how to take a square root of Python, you can Google it up. Excuse me, the square root of 4, which should be 2. So a single asterisk just means multiplication. If that was a single asterisk, it would mean 3 to the power of 2, which is 6. But since it's star star, it means to the power of. So star star means to the power of. It's the exponent operator, technical term for. So what's this business about 0 0.5? Any number to the power of 1 half is the square root of that number. Any number to the <coughs> power of one third is the cube root of it. It's just a mathematical way of expressing the square root and the cube root and so on without bringing in a square root function with an import statement. Easy way to do that. So I'm going to go back down to the homework and modify this with the expression. So to get the diagonal Pythagorean theorem says x squared plus y squared square root of. Now this isn't a math class. It's one reason why I don't get mine giving you the formula. I could make you look it up, but if you ever, if I ever don't give you the formula and you get stuck, you can't find it in Google, text me and I'll give it to you. It's not a math class. I will tell you the formula. Okay, so it's height squared, so height star star 2 is plus 
width squared, so width star star 2 in parentheses, but I need to make it a square root, so after the parentheses, star star 0 dot 5. That's the complete formula for the diagonal. There's two ways to solve this homework. By the time I tell you how to solve it, you could probably get it done in 45 seconds if you've already typed in these formulas. One is to assign, you know, 8.5 by 11, you could say width equals 8.5, height equals 11. Put those there and then print these three things out and you're done. The other thing you can do is you could take these formulas and replace the word width with 8.5 and height with 11. The first way would be better if I was going to turn around and then tell you to figure out a legal size, 8.5 and 8 by 14, right? You could just change those variables or whatever. But it's okay either way. Then your program should display the results. Make it good output. Don't just print 100 and followed by 250 comma you know, followed by 78, right? It should actually say parameter or lowercase parameter, I don't care. The output should look something like this. <coughs> parameter equals, and I don't really know what the parameter is, so I'm going to make up an invalid number, right? Area is equal to, right, that's another invalid number. And then diagonal is equal to, you know, and this is another wrong number. These values are wrong. They're just to show you. When you run it, it's going to show the diagonal being out, you know, to a whole bunch of decimal points. That's okay. We'll talk about how to round it down to something more reasonable. All right, that's the homework assignment. Now, if you have a multi-line comment like I started here, you end your multi-line comment with three more of those quotes or apostrophes. <coughs> All right, I'm going to make the Dropbox so that people who need to run out of the room can do so. Then I'll bring the homework back up if you didn't have the time to type it in, but you don't have to type it in. You know I'm going to upload it, but a lot of people like putting it in their notes. Question. Yes, sir. Um, for the homework, do you want us to use the, the fixed input or can we have the program ask the user? It's even more awesome if you ask the user for the height and the width. Good question. Can, do, are you going to use fixed values or are you going to allow the user to do input? Your choice. Your choice. It's more awesome to ask the user, right? That way they can figure out a legal size. here, but I really would like for it to, okay. I'm stymied. It's not letting me, okay, finally. I am sorry, I did not hear the question. So did you ever go back from student mode? It might be why it's that may be why. Yeah, you're right. But no, it looks like I'm just having real problems here. Once I close the window, I was definitely out of student mode. For Pete's sake. Does it work for y'all if you refresh your your screen, right? With the you know, with the refresh, does it bring the window back up? Yeah. Yay, it's just me. Okay, fine. That's what iPads are for.
All right, somebody confirm this for me, but if you click on the assignments link to the side, you should now see lecture B. Excuse me, lecture C. It doesn't have a date assigned to it yet. Probably be a nice underneath all the programming exercises, it'll pop up to the appropriate point at the top when it needs to. Do you see a lecture C? Do control F. Anybody see the lecture C? No. Nobody see it. Pardon? Sorry about this, gang. I don't know why I'm having equipment failures today. Got to be there now or I'll eat my hat, which means I have to go and buy one. So better be there. Oh, yeah. It says upcoming assignments. It's an upcoming. Right at the top. Awesome. I wish they were in the order that I put them in because I grouped them by lectures and homework and stuff, but instead it puts them in whatever order it wants. Can we go back to the script you were writing? I sure will.